Hello, Unstoppable Real Estate Investors. Uh, this is Rayana Starr with the Unstoppable Real Estate Investor podcast. Wednesdays at noon Eastern every week for the last couple of years. We've been doing this. And I have a new guest, Sharon Bornholt. And we have been chatting about AI and using it in, in marketing. And uh, so we've been having a great little chat before our <laughs> our interview. And so, Sharon, I want to welcome you uh, to the podcast, Unstoppable Real Estate Investor Podcast. Thanks well, for taking time out of your busy day to, to be with us. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So everybody, Sharon's going to talk about her journey and really um, her niche is probates. And so let's start, Sharon, with um, you know, pre-real estate investing, what you were doing before you became a real estate investor. Give us a little background on who Sharon Bornholt is. Okay. Well, my dad was a contractor growing up. So being the oldest and most well-behaved of four children, <laughs> I got to I got to go out with him on jobs. So I grew up in a kind of a he did commercial renovations, uh, mainly a lot of doctors. And so I I had that background. And then I went to work. I worked for many years in the medical field. My last uh, years, I was a practice manager. And then, you know, I just wanted my own business. And uh, I opened a home inspection business, um, which if you can think back to 1991, it was very much buyer beware. And uh, there were no laws and regulations. So it was kind of the wild, wild west. And about um, eight years into that business, you know, I worked with a lot of realtors. So one day a realtor came in and she said, you want to go to a RIA meeting? And I said something like, what's a RIA meeting? And so she told me what that was because I had no idea you could be in real estate and not be a real tour. So that was where I got interested in real estate investing. And from there, I started with my thinking of my dad. My very first project was a, a rehab. But uh, so I, that's not necessarily the way I recommend everybody start. But I had a plan to limp along with uh, buy a rehab and do a rehab or two and then buy a rental. And that was my plan. And I worked that plan for about 10 years. And then in 2008, we all know what happened. So I closed the home inspection business and that's when I went full-time into real estate. And coincidentally, at that time, number one, I had never ever wholesaled a property, which is kind of funny when I think back on it. But that, at that time, you know, people couldn't get a retail mortgage. There were deals everywhere, but you couldn't get a retail mortgage. So I kind of became an accidental wholesaler. But I also did accidental just, wholesaler. Sailor, accidental I like because that. I I had these properties and I was looking at rehabbing them. And um, then I didn't know how long I would have to hold them afterwards. And I just couldn't bear the thought of a tenant tearing up my beautiful rehab. So I called up a couple of investors that I knew that also they were they had uh, they were uh, full time businessmen with good jobs and they could still had banking relationships. And I said to them, they also had very, uh, very active real estate uh, investing businesses as far as rehabbing and buy and hold. So I just called them up and this was how easy it was to me because I had all that background. But I just said, do you all want to buy a couple of properties? And they said, sure. What do you want for them? And I just added on a, a fee and it was really that easy. <clears throat> but we both know it's not really that easy. But I had a built-in buyer's list. So that was the way I got into wholesaling. But I also discovered probates. I always worked off-market deals. That was always in my niche because I just did not want to get in there. I'm, I always tell people I'm the Libra poster child. I did not want to get in there and scrap around with a bunch of realtors and other investors for deals on the MLS. So it was a selfish reason, but I got really good. I was really good at marketing and I had used old school marketing for my other, the home inspection business. So I just carried it all forward. And uh, once I discovered probates, which by the way, in 2008, no one was working probates. All right, so hold that thought, let me back up. You were good at marketing, mm -hmm. old school, back up and talk a little bit about that. Well, I like to talk about, uh, for those few people who might be listening that were around and working before 1991, it was before the internet. We call it BI, 
the, the BI general. So you, we did direct mail marketing. We went into physical real estate offices with all sorts of things. We were always different with our marketing on Valentine's. We would take bouquets of Valentine, uh, red heart balloons. And we did always did things, but in person things. And we built a personal brand for our business and a business brand that said we were the biggest and the best. It was all about our marketing. We, we were at the top, but who knows if we were actually doing the most, I, I don't know, but that was the perception because branding is all about perception. And I always tell people marketing and branding are like a couple. You can't have one without the other. Most marketing is how you get leads, but branding is why they choose you. And that's true, whether you're working off market probates or whatever. Awesome. And I'm assuming your marketing has evolved since then. It has evolved because of the internet. However, the way you reach off-market sellers, the number one way over time is still direct mail marketing. And with probates, stop and think about it for a minute. These people have lost someone. Yeah. They have a property that if it's at part of the estate, they must sell that property. They have to liquidate that cash. It's either been inherited or it's part of an estate. So it's not a question of if they're going to sell it. It's a question of when they're going to sell it and if they're going to list it or if they're going to sell it. Now, if you are an agent investor, guess what? You can, you've can you got both sides of the equation. The leads are there every single month. It's a cycle of life. They're just It's the way it is. So direct mail marketing, by using that soft touch marketing you are not causing these people any further pain or grief. They have to take care of the business of settling the estate. And when you use the direct mail marketing and reach out to them and you're, what you're saying to them is, this is what I do and I'll be here when you're ready to sell. No high pressure, no banging on doors. They don't like to be text. God forbid they do not like to be called because they're, they get over... They're, the, going the grief. Grieving yeah. they're going through a grieving process. And when they're ready, when they open the estate, they're essentially raising their hands saying, I'm ready to sell the property because you can't buy it before that anyway. So there's no getting there first. Um, wait, when the estate is open, then you can start market, marketing to them. But from there, it's a process where you just gently take them down a path and you're there when they're ready. Okay. So talk about how long you've been in real estate investing and what you've done in real estate investing. Like you stumbled into accidental wholesaling back in the 90s mm -hmm. and talk about your journey since then. It's been, uh, you know, I kept on doing, I kept on wholesaling for a long time. I got really good and built, uh, you know, a bank of cash um, about Five years ago, I guess, well, 10, 2010, I started a blog, which was basically uh, to chronicle my journey and to tell people, this is what I did. Maybe you want to do this, but maybe not this, you know, because we all do things. We, we, and I like sharing the knowledge. So in 2013, I started the podcast and kind of organically, I started doing People ask for seminar, you know, would you do a small group, this or that? And along the way, I decided that I, about five years ago, I primarily started teaching what I know and helping people to grow a profitable business by using off-market uh, leads, specifically probates. And that's where I found my joy. So it's been 25 years, Rainus. 1998 was the year I started I've done rehabbing, I've done, you know, buy and hold, I've done wholesaling, I've done lease options, I've done most all of the strategies. And but I reached a point where I just really loved saying, hey, let me help you fix your marketing. Let me help you. Let me help you make this easier for you. And that's where I really started to find my joy. So are you like a marketing coach for real estate investors? I, I do that. I teach probate investing. Um, I do want some one-on-one. -on -one. I, I like to, I like to do group things and things like that. I'm right now I've just gotten a new probate list. I'm going to going to test some new marketing, some strategies and uh, just try it, try it out. But I think you have to have, when it comes to marketing, 
I think you need three to five strategies. Everyone does. And that though they will look different from for everyone. I talked to someone the other everybody to listen to what she just said because I work with clients and I'm like, look, we want to have at least three different marketing mm -hmm. campaigns going because mm -hmm. you don't want all your eggs in one basket. And I have one client that he is just a one trick pony. We're either focused on a seller campaign where he's texting and mm -hmm. calling and having his VAs do that, or he shifted to an agent outreach campaign and all he does is that. And I'm saying, mm -hmm. do two or three different campaigns so all your eggs aren't in one basket in case the market fluctuates and it impacts that that way of generating leads. Well, and to your point, back in uh, back when the market crashed and uh, you know there was a change. Some people were only buying foreclosures. Some people were buying uh, tax liens. And I heard someone say at my real estate investors meeting, "I guess I'm going to have to go back and go old school and do direct mail again." And I just had to laugh because for people that uh, are really smart. That has always been one of their channels. I just had to chuckle. But there are so many ways of building your business. I I think website leads are very valuable. You should have a lead generation website. Networking is the most underrated marketing strategy on the planet because you don't know when you'll get a deal. It might be tomorrow. It might be five years from now. Somebody picks up the phone and calls you and said, hey, I remember you. You did this. My aunt's passed away or she's moving out of state and she has this property. Do you still do this thing? So putting yourself out there, not at certainly at real estate meetups and uh, investment groups is important. But also, if you are, um, if you belong to any other kind of a group, it can be chamber of commerce, uh, a women's group, something that's not even just real estate. Put yourself out there and be the only person in the room that does what you do. You know, be visible. You cannot be the best kept secret in town and think you're going to grow a business. I agree. Yeah. I I think a lot of newer investors, especially just think they're going to learn the business and then sit and stuff's going to happen. And they yeah. don't get that, you know, marketing and operations are the heart and lungs of the business. Mm -hmm. If you're not mm -hmm. staying on top of the day to day and organized and tracking things mm -hmm. and staying on top of operations, that's the backbone. But marketing is bringing them in the door. And mm -hmm. if you, if you're not being consistent in the way you're generating leads and finding opportunities, then you're on a roller coaster ride. Mm -hmm. And it's not a very empowered place to be because you're you're waiting for other people to toss you a fish mm -hmm. and you'll go hungry if they don't have any. You've got to learn how to fish. And I think that's why wholesaling is a good place for newer investors to start because it's teaching them the fundamental mm -hmm. of hunting for their own food, yes. getting out there and knowing how to find deals, how to analyze them, how to dispo them, learning how to hunt for their food mm -hmm. so that, yeah, they may evolve. And when they automate and delegate and scale, their mm -hmm. wholesalers is part of their marketing strategy, turning to wholesalers, but also having their own team, you know, doing a campaign or two. So I absolutely agree with you. And I think when you look at social media and you look at how much, uh, how much you said, I've been seeing your stuff, how much I'm prolific and consistent and have been for a while, that that only just gets you on the map. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. all of a sudden people are flocking to you. You've got to keep being out there, keep letting people know what you do, how you help. And so I absolutely agree that really marketing is at the foundation of your success as a real estate investor. It, it is. And to, to a couple of your points, number one is consistency. 
once you understand direct mail marketing, 81% of your deals, not your calls, but your deals will come at or beyond your fifth mailing. So, and 80% of your deals over your lifetime will come from consistent follow-up often after someone has said no. That's something I didn't learn when I first started out. Now, your competition, you say, oh, but there's so much competition out there. And what Rain and I would say to you is that's really not true because they don't stay in the game. 90% of your competitors will stop mailing direct mail on or before their third track. So you have to be the last man standing. So that's one thing. The second thing oh, wait, is- Hold that thought. Yeah. Quick interjection. Mm -hmm. In your pockets, the research shows that in our industry as real estate investors, only not, not only 5%. 5% mm -hmm. survive, thrive, succeed at it. That means mm -hmm. there's a 95% failure rate for that reason right there. A lack of consistency, not being organized, not treating it like a business, mm -hmm. expecting a quick windfall and easy money. And, and they're not willing to do the work. When we had the home inspection business and my daughter worked with me in that business, and mind you, I wasn't crawling under anybody's house. I was the lowly owner. Um, I, had, I had inspectors, but we did an experiment one year. It's We were always marketing, but you have to make yourself accountable for your marketing. I have a Google calendar. I have an agenda. I have all calendars, but I will tell you what changed the course of our business in that home inspection business. One year we went to I guess Office Depot or one of the places. And we bought a big wall calendar, the kind that you flip over. And we wrote down, okay, these are the direct mail dates. These are the dates we go to meetings because they are business. They're not just meetings and go to lunch. You're there to grow your brand or you should be there to make contacts and grow your brand. And we would put down other things we were doing. Uh, like if it was Valentine's Day, this is the week we're going to take our uh, our gift out, our balloons out to the to the people. The year we did that, we every month we would flip that big calendar over. And then if we had a month where we said, what happened to June? We'd go back and look, oh, well, you know, we kind of dropped the ball there. Our business grew 300%. So when you look at that every day, and I know it's really old school, but it works. When you are accountable you to yourself. Yeah, it's a relationship business. You got to mm -hmm. get out there and see and be seen. Yes. And that's for people that are brand new and they say, I'm brand new. I don't have a brand. I'm not going to worry about a brand. That is the wrong answer. You should be building your brand from day one. And if you run into Raina at a meeting, you should go up to her and simply say, hey, Raina or hey, Sharon, I'm John and your full name and I'm brand spanking new and I'm here to learn. How can I support you? So do you think they're going to remember that? Well, heck yes, they're going to remember that. And yeah, it's because, not- Especially if you follow up, like if- Right. So when I talk to people about strategic networking, mm -hmm. I say, look, you're not going to go in there and spam everybody with your, your business card. You're not going to do that. If you go in there and make two or three- mm -hmm quality connections, and then follow up with them and start developing a relationship with them. And you do that, you know, every week or at least a couple times a month, and you're consistent and you use a service like send out cards. And all you have to do to be ahead of everybody else is follow up. Is follow up. And I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give you a tip. I 100% I agree with that. Don't think about masses, find two or three people. And one, number one tip, don't always be in an ask position. Don't go at it with what, what can Raina do right. for me? You say go what in there with who can I help? And if you always, yes, then yes, when you need, so help. Yeah. I'm big on sending out cards too, but I'll tell you the tool that I love more than anything. And you can get started free with this one too. It's called Bonjoro. It's B-O-N-J-O-R-O, -O, and it's a video tool. I think um, I pay $15 a month for Bonjuro now, but you can pop out your Say phone. Again, Bonjuro. B-O-N-J-O. Oh. So you pull out your phone. You could literally be at the meeting in the parking lot and go, hey, Raina, 
This is John. We talked at the meeting tonight. It was so great meeting you. I would love for you to let me know how I can support you. And here's my phone number. And then you hit send, you, you know, you've gotten their cards, you've got their email address, just like that. You meet with a seller. I always send a bonjour. Hey, it's Sharon. Maybe I'll say, I look forward to working with you on this on and purchasing your property. But I might also say, Hey, Raina, I know we didn't reach an agreement on the property, but I enjoyed uh, meeting you. And thanks so much for showing me your property. If your situation changes, I'd love to be your plan B. You can reach me at, here's my phone number. But it is a, a next level touch. I, I still believe you send handwritten thank you notes when you look at a property. Really old school, totally works. Because if they if they got upset about your offer, they most likely threw your business card in the garbage. So you get to send them another business card, but also follow up with the bonjour. They love it. Trust me, nobody is thanking people when, when they join your program, they get your course or they, you do, you work together in any way, send them a bonjour. They absolutely love it. And do they remember you? Yes, they rem it's remember like, you. You're like sending a little video card. Yes, and it's it can be 30 seconds, 60 seconds. It's absolutely genius. Can you use those Bonjour links on social media? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can. They give you a link. And I've got, uh, you can make a tutorial for people. You can teach the use. You can get, like I've taught my students how to use it. And the funny thing is I've had them send me right back a Bonjour and thank me for the, for the training. I love it. It's like, that's yay, good. action taker. But that's my, I, I love these quick little technology things, but I love Bonjour. And uh, every now and then, if you've got a student or something, you can reach out to them and say, hey, how's it coming? I was just thinking about you. How's your course or whatever it is? Uh, just send me an email or send me a bonjour back. They have an opportunity to respond to that uh, video so they can send you a video. So yeah, it's a are you, did you join my group, the unstoppable real estate? Investor? I did. I did. Yeah. When we're done with this, go, go in that group and find this live and drop in Opus and Bonjuro as links for everybody okay. in the comments. Okay. My VA Rose might be watching this for us. Okay. Right let me see if she's she's on with us and let me just go on there um on my phone i'll be happy to drop those in there because then yeah. it'll be searchable for people when they forget like we all do unstoppable real estate investors okay so all right i can put it in there um so opus o p u s you know opus clip yeah, I think it's dot io. I think. Yeah, I think it is because mm -hmm. opus dot com doesn't work. I think it's opus cl opus clip dot io. I think no, um, but I just is it opus dot io. Um, hang on, I found it. I love that little tool. And this it's is for Opus. anyone. Dot pro. Okay. So Opus. this this is a tip. You check this out. If you as far as building your brand and setting your marketing apart, you should be creating some kind of little, some kind of content, but you can create these little short videos and then you can chop them up in Opus Clip. Uh, you can go in and try it out for free. It'll we'll put a title on it, it'll put captions on it. It's magic. It's my new favorite magic tool. Yeah, to I love GPT. it. Um, I'm downloading these and then I'm also putting the link in there for mm -hmm. people. Bonjuro. Uh, hold on a second here. Bon but this is the way you set yourself apart as a real estate investor. You do something different. I, I interviewed Mike Michalowicz for my podcast, the uh, author who writes for entrepreneurs and uh, his latest book is called get different marketing that can't be ignored and that's what we talked about and that's a book every uh, business person should read uh, what is it the book get different marketing that can't be ignored get a uh, book 
book recommendation. Get different. It's Mike Michalowicz, M I C A L O W I C Z. He's you, written books. Uh, say that again. M I C H A L O W I C Z. Well, I know how to spell Michael. Mick. Yeah. It says Mike. It's not Michael. It's Mike. Mike Mick McCallowis. Let me put it in the chat here. That's probably. I'm trying to drop it in the comments for people. Yeah. Now I'm. Okay, so it's almost like you're spelling out Michael. No, it's Mike. No, no, the last name is almost like you're spelling out Michael at the beginning of it. Okay, and the book is called Get, Get Different. Get Different. Marketing that can't be ignored. He's written a lot of books, including Profit First, which is a book every real estate investor should read. Uh, Clockwork, which is all about setting up systems and processes. I love his books. Yeah, I, I'm. You, you would probably like Gino Wickman too. I know I, about him too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rocket Fuel, mm -hmm. um, Traction. Mm -hmm. Um, EO, the, what is an EOS anyway, mm -hmm. you know, in, um, entrepreneur operating system. Yeah, that's great. I love these marketing tips and sprinkling little tools people can use. That's mm -hmm. always, that always adds value for people. So what you've been at this game for a long time, Sharon, marketing is the key to your success. Talk about how you stumbled into probates a little more. Well, I was just, like I said, I'd always worked off market deals, um, everything off market, because I just, I like that you get the opportunity to talk directly to the seller. Yeah. And that's a scary thing for a lot of people when you're starting, but there is no substitute for getting in front of a seller. And I love agents. I have many agent friends. Uh, I've worked through agents uh, for a de few decades now, but they don't always understand our business and they work from a commission based mindset if they're not an, an investor as well. So it's sometimes hard for them to justify this low offer that you've just made their seller. For that reason, I like uh, getting in front of these people, but I just have always used direct mail and you can buy lists for most of these things. Uh, you know, whether it's out of town owners or high equity plus something I like uh, lead stocking where, for instance, you would say if you were going to target out of state uh, absentee owners, you might say that have uh, have this much equity in their home, which was always a piece I did 50 to 100 percent equity. You don't want people that uh, don't have any equity. So if you can find multiple things that they do, that's great. But in, in doing all of that, I just started hearing about probate. And I, do, I just had to keep digging, Raina, because there was no information on probate investing. I mean, there was nothing. Well, yeah, because you're one of the one of the really early, early adopters or whatever you yeah. for that yeah yeah and so that led me to create a lot of content of you know, free content for people and then ultimately it led me to create a course on how to do this the proper way so that you if you don't do it the right way you're going to make people upset and angry and i always tell people you've got to learn you can't get your leads and then just start sending out direct mail it doesn't work because you have to know the boring middle you have to know how the process works. It's a pretty much a straight line process in every state. You need to know when you can buy the house and you need to understand the mindset of the of the uh, person selling the property. And you need to fix your mindset in most cases because investors think, oh, that's creepy. I don't know how to talk to these people. There's nobody ever going to tell you the sad way their, their loved one passed away. They're not going to do that. They're, they're there because they have a job to do. They have to, they have to settle this estate. And 
Real estate investors and agents play an integral part in this process because they have a property that they have to sell. It's either inherited or they have to sell it. Yeah, and I think also you do have to be compassionate without being mm -hmm. intrusive that mm -hmm. in this particular incident, this niche, you truly are providing a service because mm -hmm. if they don't have to deal with a realtor and that whole process yep. and it's easier for them to offload the program, pro the, the property and, and do it with less red tape, mm -hmm. um, it's one thing in the middle of a grieving process that mm -hmm. you're taking off their plate that they don't have to deal with, especially if you're understanding and you're not being insensitive and just trying to get a deal out of them. Exactly. And that all, it comes about by understanding how everybody's feeling. Now with, I know a lot of men, I have a lot of male students that are really good at this. But I have to say, I think women are uniquely suited for to be probate investors because you are just most, you know, a great many women have had children. They, they're moms. They're compassionate by nature. They may be care caregivers or have been caregivers. It's just um, it's just an e easy conversation, too, once you know a few tricks. For instance, if you walk into a probate property and you know that their dad passed away and you see golf clubs in the corner, you say something like, oh, was your dad the golfer? And they'll either say yes or no, but that's your conversation starter. And then most times they'll say, yes, my dad loved golf. Or you see a kitchen full of cookbooks and you know the mom passed away. You'd say, oh, was your mom the, the person in your family that loved to cook? Yes, she cooked every holiday, yada, yada, yada. And that's how the conversation starts. It has nothing to do with what has happened to get them to this place. And once they're done, you have to be a good listener because they're going to want to tell you a story and you listen to the story and then you'll know when it's right. And then you say, would you like to show me around the property? There is really, I tell people this, there is really no weirdness around working with probates at all. And it's a great opportunity to make money. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think a lot of people are afraid of probates because mm -hmm. of that there was death someone mm -hmm. died and they think, Ooh, that's creepy or, mm -hmm. Ooh, I don't want to bother people, but they mm -hmm. don't really realize that actually that is probably an area as a real estate investor that requires the most amount of compassion and empathy. Mm -hmm. And also you truly are serving someone mm -hmm. when, when, when people are going through probate, they're getting hit with a lot of someone else's life responsibilities mm -hmm. being dumped in their lap and they're trying yeah. to sort through all that right and taking one of those decisions one of those problems off their plate is a very compassionate thing they just want to go on with their life really they just want to go on with their life and i have this is a true statement i've gotten more hugs at probate closings than any other type of closings they oh. literally are so grateful that you understood the process you understood what they were feeling that you let them move at their own pace and then you always add in the the magic bullet in your contract if and that is once you've taken everything out of the property I, I know this is a difficult process for you if you want you can just let me know when that is and I'll take care of the rest and that is simply a line item you figure into your offer if things are donatable, like furniture, sometimes there's some good stuff there you can or donate. You run the estate sale for them, and then you do the demo and all that. So you can, yeah, you can I think do that's it. great. Yeah, yeah. I've had clients that it wasn't a probate, but it's similar in nature of how can I serve this person in this mm -hmm. difficult transition they're making. And I had a gentleman; he loved these kinds of deals too, where he bought a place and there was a little old lady renting it. And she was really, no, she was the owner. There was a little mm -hmm. old lady that owned it, but really needed to move because she couldn't keep it up anymore. And she was really struggling with moving forward with the deal because her biggest concern was moving. The mm -hmm. actual act of moving, the expense of that yeah. and finding another place to live. Mm -hmm. And the client 
helped her do all that and even showed up on moving day, mm -hmm. found the movers for her, helped with the moving, gave her $5,000 out of the deal. So she mm -hmm. had some money to move. So it was just beautiful. And he felt so good about the deal because he had really taken care of her. I've I've done that. I've and I've hired a hired a moving van once. Uh, it was a, a wholesale deal, and it was uh, the tenant just wouldn't move, and she was going to lose the property. And I kept going back to this tenant because it was this was a nice property, and I said, "Look, you're going to be out of a a place to live anyway because the share with well, the sheriff sale, the commissioner sale is scheduled for this date." what's your hold up? You know, I will hire a moving van. And she said, you can give me a check. I said, no, I'll, I'll hire the movers. I'll be here on moving day. And when all the things are moved out, I will pay the movers. And that's how I handled that. It was no way was I giving her the check and trusting that that was going to happen. Right. And also, by the way, had a locksmith there that day, changed the locks on the house and sent the actual owner the keys to her property. So you do... You just do what you have to do. I've met. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't this. it? How renters, mm -hmm. how many states, I live in a state that's renter friendly, how mm -hmm. renters have more rights than the person who owns the property, the property. And, mm -hmm. you know, landlords are set up as these bad guys. Well, it's like when we were going through the pandemic and rents were, you know, there was forgiveness and you couldn't mm -hmm. evict. I thought, well, what about the the yeah. owner of the property who has a mortgage to pay exactly. and now that's going to affect their credit and they can't collect rent on something that they're paying a mortgage on. So, you know, it's just um, crazy to me that renters would have more power than the actual owner of the property, you know. My, my oldest daughter manages a portfolio of properties for a single investor. And uh, during the pandemic, they, they have a lot of property, single family and apartments and commercial. And where the single family is concerned, she spent a great deal of her time uh, always knowing where the aid was coming from, getting the aid. And she collected well over $200,000 for her owner. So that was a, a job in itself. But it was a tough, tough time for landlords. And you had it, you, and if you are a working person that has a handful of properties that you self manage, maybe you've got your own job, you've got your own home, and then you get uh, thrown this monkey wrench. Right. Finding the time to do all of this and fill out the paperwork because you sure as heck can't count on them to fill it out because they they're living rent free. What do what do they care? You know they they can only see today. I don't have to pay rent today this month. Right. Right. So. What's your focus nowadays in your business? Well, I'm always still, still, you know, in the probate world, I'm always still marketing and I'm always learning new technology, which we've kind of talked about to help my uh, people in my world to build a better business, a better brand and make their marketing easier. Um, there are systems and things for cold calling. If that's what you want to do. I talked to somebody the other day that did a lot of door knocking. God bless them. I'm not ever doing that. <laughs> Just like I'm not ever doing cold calling. It's I'm more of a build your brand and, and get the deals that way. I think the smartest thing you can do is like we talked about earlier, be consistent with your marketing, all, you know, find a niche and work that and have three, three to five lead channels. If one dries up, then you've got another way to get your leads. I agree. And that'll that'll look different. I mean, maybe it's cold calling and driving for dollars and direct mail. It doesn't matter what they are, just that you have them be consistent. Always be building your brand because your brand makes your uh, makes them choose you from your marketing. And and learn being a being uh an avid learner, you know, I don't think I know that I will never quit learning, but use technology and don't be afraid of it. You know, we all have to learn it when we find something new. Yeah, I have clients that'll come on board and um, often say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not very tech savvy or I, I'm not good with technology. And I said, well, let's change your mindset on that. Mm -hmm. It's a learnable yeah. skill you can identify with, I'm not good with technology, or you can shift the way you approach it and say, oh, 
I just need to learn technology. Mm -hmm. And like the things we talked about today, Von Jural and Opus Clip, I will guarantee you it's less than five minutes learning curve. It's drop dead easy. Oh, that's great. That's so great. there are a lot of things that you can do that aren't hard. There are some things that are bigger that take more of a commitment, like starting a podcast. But there are also VAs and people out there that are supremely qualified to do it quicker and better than you can do it for a fraction yeah, of the my cost. VA goes basically I created the process and there's a lot that goes into yep. consistently producing a podcast which mm -hmm. we call this a podcast it's really not a podcast it's a live mm -hmm. video podcasts are really audios but anyway um and we have a whole process that goes into scheduling a guest every week mm -hmm. and we've laid it out now my VA basically does all of it all I do mm -hmm. is show up and be the interviewer. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, you're right. And again, that's how you scale a business. You're, you're creating processes, you're refining them, and then you're delegating them to someone to do mm -hmm. for you. I'm curious, Sharon, what would you, if you were to jump up on a rooftop and you had words of wisdom that you could depart to a captive audience that was hanging on your every word, like they were going to listen to your advice what would your advice be to a newer investor? It would be to try out, dabble in all of the things a little bit and see what, what suits you given your talents, your skills, and your money. If you don't have access to money, then you're probably not going to want to start right out with rehabbing. So learn or the right. basics. Wholesaling, you will learn to put a deal together. You will learn what is a good deal. That's always a good place to start. But once you've done that, niche down, find out where your strengths are, find out what you like and become known for something. And then focus on your marketing, focus on building your brand. And you can do that with simple things like video with social media posts. It's it's not as hard as you think no, it's not. to become a, a person who's is known. Is to have some kind of an image, a logo, a color scheme, a theme, and then to just get out there in front of people and consistently interact and provide value and keep showing up like, you know, um, mm -hmm. this is a brand, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, I'm not selling anything on my podcast. It's mm -hmm. value add constantly. And so is my Facebook group so that then when I do pitch about my my coaching, it's not that they're always getting pressured. I'm not selling them anything. It's more like, let me build a community. Let me provide value. And by the way, when you need it and you're ready to take things to the next level, I'm here to coach you through it. Yes, and then to, there are two facets to branding which people should understand. And uh, Raina touched on the physical attributes of your branding. Don't spend a lot of time on that. Get something that looks nice. You know, you need something that's true. But at its core, your brand is what people think about you. It's how you show up. And it's often said that your brand is what people say about you when you walk out of the room. Uh, Raina, Raina is consistent. She's got great. She's got a Facebook group. Sharon does this. She does that. It's more about always doing what you say you're going to do, showing up like you say you're going to show up, but it is how you make people feel. That is truly your brand. Are you trustworthy? Do they want to work with you? Will they take your offer, which is maybe slightly less than the guy that was a jerk? You know, did you did you bond and build rapport with that seller? So your brand is many, many things. Part of it is your physical brand and the rest of it is how you show up. Yep. And that's what you got to get really good at. Absolutely. And being consistent. You've said that a few times. I'm going to just mm -hmm. piggyback on that. Consistent, consistent, consistent. Mm -hmm. In fact, you don't have to actually work that hard or do that much. You just no to be consistent in what you do do now also it's marketing is an experiment you've got to experiment until you find what works for you i've i've tried a lot of things in my marketing 
you know, a theme for each day of the week. I and realized, wow, that's a wasted effort. We're really not getting that much engagement mm-hmm. on that. I've tried the tip of the week, which is a which is a hit. And then at the end of the week, a weekly check-in that no one was really responding to that. So mm-hmm. I'll try things, I'll stop things, but you know, I am consistent, prolific. There's a blog post going out every week. Everyone hears from me every week. They're mm-hmm. getting an email a day, five days a week, telling them about something. It takes them a minute to, hey, by the way, we're tip of the week on Monday. Blog goes out on Tuesday. Our podcast is on Wednesday. Friday, they're getting a lead magnet. Thursday, I forget what we do on Thursday. Mm-hmm. My VA does all that for me. Mm-hmm. It's yes. Con- See. Yeah. Well, and it's just uh, repurposing too. You can create content and, and yeah. repurpose it. So I think where a lot of us fail too, and certainly early on, we think we have to every day be creating something new, blogs, podcasts, videos, yeah, whatever it is. You can back. Yeah, but you yeah. can repurpose things because we assume that everybody's seen everything and when they haven't. Well, so, we have short memory spans. Like, uh, mm-hmm. The books, the go-to books that I recommend my clients read, like E-Myth and Traction and Rocket mm-hmm. Fuel and others, uh, Think and Grow Rich, um, The Power of Focus, things like that. It's, there are books I try and read every year, every couple of years, because you forget and you just mm-hmm. need to be reminded. Exactly. I read the E-Myth and I've probably re- read it several times. Yeah, I know. It's always this, uh, oh, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you're at a different place every time you read it. Because I think I have the E-Myth and then I have the one E-Myth Revisited, which is, there's probably a nuance in there, but I don't remember it from the first book. Whatever yeah. it is, I don't know. Repetition is the mother of mastery. And unless mm-hmm. we're using what we've read, it easily gets forgotten. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the highest percentage of retention, 90% of retention is doing what you've learned. Exactly. We're going to remember it and teaching it, teaching it to others. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to say or share before we wrap up, Sharon? I think that to know, I know that we all talk about mindset a lot, to know that this is a, uh, this is a really simple business, but it's not always easy. And the, the true success is in not giving up. And like Raina said, I too have tried a lot of things. Uh, a lot of them didn't work. A lot of them didn't work the first or second time, but worked the third time. So you have to just keep plugging away. And you're real, the only way you can really fail is if you quit. So learn from mentors. That is the another big tip. We've all had mentors. We all, no matter where we are, have coaches. We, we have people that teach us things. So don't ever think you, you've outgrown that. You need, you need uh, a leg up, a hand up to get to the next step always. So invest in yourself. I mean, Absolutely. I cannot stress that enough. Invest yep. in yourself and your education. The free stuff is great, but it will only take you so far. Yeah, and a lot of people say, well, I can't afford it. And I'm, well, when you know what your time is worth mm-hmm. and how much faster getting support expedites it gets you there yes. faster and easier yes you 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 quickly begin to realize wow i can't afford not to can't afford not to and you it's true everything is available on the internet but it's kind of like saying get your college education on the internet it's all there but it's not laid out in an organized fashion where you learn by a step by step process and you get from point a to point b so that's why you invest in coaching. It's to get to your, get your results faster so that you can make more money faster. And you will always get a return on your investment if you implement what you've learned. If you, if you never implement, then it's of no value. Um, I have just thoroughly enjoyed this. I feel like every word that we've said in this interview has been packed with value for people. Those resources on the video editing and the video sharing. Mm-hmm. I think that when when you can give people tools like that, that's always useful. 
So I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with me. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet. Yeah, it's been a blast. So, so yeah. much fun. It's just a, con a, a conversation. Neither one of us really knew where it was going. And that was fine, fine with me. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for joining us. We do this podcast every Wednesday at noon Eastern in my group, The Unstoppable Real Estate Investor, right here. And if you know of someone who is successful, experienced real estate investor who has made it, they're thriving and supporting themselves comfortably in real estate as an investor. Please uh, let them know about our my podcast. We'd love to interview them. I think we're scheduling into the new year now. So we're starting to book guests for the first quarter of 2024. We would love to see more of you on here. This podcast is to build community, get people to know each other, learn about different people's niches and specialties, because in the end, we may compete for properties, but after that, we're all in this together, helping each other out. Thanks so much, Sharon. Thank you, Raina. Bye, everybody. Happy Bye. hump day. Have a great rest of your week. Take action. No excuses. Go get results. Bye now.